morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this NASIMA webinar on the World Trade Organization Trade Facilitation Agreement and its implication for the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Um, I'll be sharing on the screen very shortly the agenda, uh, which I would express. Um, and then we'll go straight to the business of the day, uh, where we'll be having two speakers. My name is Okwayemi Alaro. I'm head of research at NASIMA, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, to this webinar, we have two main speakers. Um, Mr. Kola Wale Shofola, the Acting Director of Trade in the ECOWAS Commission, will be speaking on the importance of trade facilitation to regional integration. And um, Mr. Ali Abubakar, ably represented by Mr. Ali uh, Abu Unda, will be speaking on the TFA implement implementation in Nigeria. Uh, once again, I'd like to apologize for starting slightly behind schedule. Uh, but with that, we would be moving straight into the next uh, item on the agenda, uh, which is the opening remarks by the DG of NASIMA, Ambassador Ayola Olukoni. Uh, once again, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, and uh, uh, I look forward to the deliberations and the questions and answers that will come from that. Good morning. Uh, Ambassador Olukoni, you have the floor, sir. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I was trying to join with my video. I'm not sure if uh, you say you cannot start your video. Uh, it looks like the video is disabled. Can you hear me, Okwe? Yes, sir. I'll see what I can do from here, but uh, you, you should be able to... Okay. You, you should be able to start your video, but I'll see what technical issues there might be from here, sir. Well, okay. Well, if uh, if you cannot start, I think there's a picture there. Um, but for, first, let me say thank you to everybody for uh, joining us on this uh, uh, webinar. And it's indeed a pleasure, uh, especially uh, for us to look at the whole question of uh, trade facilitation uh, within, within the context of the AFCTA. This is key. This is very important. Um, I think the first thing, and so I want to thank and I welcome others who are here with us from Ministry of Trade and all of this as well. I think the first thing we should uh, accept it, um, is that um, despite the crisis as well as the um, COVID pandemic itself is concerned, um, indeed, um, it's a reality for all of us. And so uh, we, are, we, are, we are here, we are with it, we're stuck with it. Um, and it's not even a question of stuck with it. I think it's an existential reality. So we must, we must uh, start to get ready for it. And if we know, you will observe that uh, indeed um, there's been talk about, look, with the COVID pandemic, that actually uh, looks like everybody's now going to withdraw into their shell to try and see how they can survive this crisis. Um, but I think the conclusion has been reached that indeed, rather than withdrawing to our shells uh, as individual countries across the world, or even especially in Africa, that the AFCT itself is one of the strategic options for getting out of this crisis. So that's, that's, that argument is settled. And I think we should key into that as a country, as Nigeria. I think you have, uh, um, we have been, of course, indeed um, accepted this reality. And I think this is one of the things which, of course, inspired this uh, focus. So, the momentum should be kept alive. We should keep on the momentum as far as this is concerned. And this is one of the strategies of keeping the momentum uh, on. Well, we are very much familiar with the AFCT itself as a whole. Um, the whole process is said took a lot from the WTO in terms of trade facilitation. And I think um, we're not reinventing the wheel in this particular area. There, there are a lot of areas, a lot of issues where, which we can learn from that particular uh, process. You know, like we said, I think it's a huge continental uh, trade uh, agreement. Uh, it's been long in coming in terms of our forebearers, our uh, leaders, African leaders who 
immediately after political independence, say, look, the next thing, of course, should be economic independence. And has been talking about the question of how do we um, get together as a continent? Um, you know, so this, this is it. It is taking close to 60 years. If you look at the fact that the AU, the AU itself was established, I think close to 1960 itself, and um, maybe 1963 there about, and we, 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 it, it has not been easy, but it's, it, it, is, it has worth all the effort, all the energy which we are putting to it. So that is why I think I'm indeed very glad that we are here. Um, the COVID pandemic itself has not been allowed uh, to be cloud us or to say, no, we are going, we're, not going, we're not going to go on with it. And Nigeria, of course, you know, has signed. And the vision is that by January, they're about, at the end of the day, trading will begin under the AFCTA. So what are the nitty gritties? What are the areas? That is why we're looking at this, this particular uh, uh, event today. And we sincerely hope that all our contributors here and there will be able to give us ideas in terms of what well, because we need to know what are the nitty gritties what are the areas there have been so much fears in nigeria about the afct um i'm not saying there are no difficulties but um of course what we must do is to keep up the spirit learn what exactly is uh, 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 the nitty gritty of it what 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 will be involved the respective areas in trading goods uh, the rules of origins your question of trade and investment uh, but we have a lot to learn as far as the WTO itself is concerned in terms of trade facilitation. Um, these are the various areas which, of course, I sincerely hope we will look into. Of course, this webinar is not a silver bullet. It's not the end of it. We'll still continue to engage ourselves in, you know, uh, in discussion. Um, there are news are filtering that indeed the Secretary General of the FCTA, uh, Wamkale Mene, is going to be in town sometimes next week. Uh, we're sincerely looking forward to, uh, to engaging him too as well um, so that uh, uh, we can see uh, what exactly are the plans, are the arrangement. But I think his visit to Nigeria, expected visit to Nigeria, is an indication of the fact that Nigeria is key and very important in all of this. And of course, we have the various stakeholders. Concern, organizations and all, are all going to be part and parcel of what takes off effectively. But the bulk of it is to ensure that my stakeholders, and especially uh, the private sector, because don't let us forget, it is the private sector that creates a government agreement. Implementation is the private sector. And that's why, of course, we need to bring the private sector to speak as far as all of this is concerned. Um, I think I haven't said that. Let me just leave also it. And let us uh, share our circle that at the end of this webinar, uh, in terms of taking full advantage to your is concerned. Once again, thank you all of us. Success with the mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DG, Ambassador Ayola Olukone. Um, uh, to all participants who may not be aware, um, Ambassador Ayola Olukone is, is a seasoned diplomat with over 35 years of experience in Nigeria's foreign service and was a former ambassador of Nigeria to Australia. Australia. He's currently the Director General of the Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines, and Agriculture. Um, once again, I welcome you. And um, for those who may not be too familiar with the concepts that we're discussing today, briefly, um, I would just like to uh, have you understand that the AFCTA, although they may sound like two different concepts, the AFCTA is an agreement that uh, countries in Africa have signed into, and it is hoped that this agreement um, will lift 30 million people out of poverty by ensuring that African countries can trade 
uh, freely amongst themselves. The Trade Facilitation Agreement, on the other hand, um, is an agreement by the World Trade Organization that seeks to reduce uh, the cost of trading across borders. Um, so today, what this webinar is trying to focus on uh, is to look into the implications of the Trade Facilitation Agreement on the AFCTA vis-a-vis -vis the fact that um, the AFCTA may or may not succeed if it's still very expensive to trade that cost products. Uh, with that, I'm going to be introducing our first speaker for today. Uh, his name is Mr. Kolawole Shofola. He's currently the Acting Director Trade at the ECOWAS Commission. Uh, Mr. Kola Shufola is a development economist and is a chartered management accountant with public and private sector experience in international trade, private sector development, finance, and management. His private sector experience includes various roles with multinational blue chip giant Siemens in Europe and America, while his public service records include working for the government of Ghana in the Ministry for Private Sector Development, as well as the ECOWAS Commission. At the ECOWAS Commission, he was previously the principal program officer for multilateral trade, and his key focus in his current role is trade facilitation. Please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Kola Shofola as he makes his presentation on the importance of trade facilitation to regional integration. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Moderator. And um, thank you very much for inviting the ECOWAS Commission to participate in this important webinar. Um, to the Ambassador Arola Lukani, the DG of NASIMA, to members of NASIMA, and to distinguished invited guests, it's indeed a pleasure for the ECOWAS Commission to take part in this important webinar that focuses on trade facilitation within the context also of a very important um, initiative in Africa, which is the African Continental Free Trade Area. As introduced, my name is Kola Wale Shufala, Acting Director for Trade at the ECOWAS Commission, and I've had the pleasure to serve the community in the last 14 years, focusing primarily on trade facilitation amongst um, other issues, as well as trade negotiations. I just have a few moments to make a presentation, and um, the request for my presentation was on the importance of trade facilitation to regional integration. And I'll try and be as brief as possible, but knowing that um, um, trade facilitation agreement itself took a number of years to negotiate and um, compressing this into a few minutes um, will indeed be a challenge, but hopefully it will just give you a flavor of the key issues. The presentation will have a very brief introduction looking at some key indicators. Before I um, go on to the WTO trade facilitation agreement, some of the key elements of that, and then looking very briefly at the overall African continental free trade area, um, um, framework and the trade facilitation provisions within before also touching upon a number of key regional trade facilitation issues. So looking at the logistic performance in this index, um, we're aware that the logistic performance index um, measures or ranks countries according to six dimensions of trade. Um, it looks at the efficiency of custom and border management, the quality of trade and transport infrastructure, um, the arrangement of competitively priced shipments, the competence and the quality of logistic services, um, amongst others. And if we look at the ranking for Nigeria in particular, as listed here between ECOWAS member states, we see that Nigeria has actually declined in the ranking from 90 in 2016 to 110th position in 2018. And this survey is done every two years. Within the region, Nigeria rates favorably towards the top half, but um, essentially there's still a lot more work to be done to improve competitiveness of um, these instruments, in particular those pertaining to logistic performance. Mm -hmm. And if you also look at trading across borders, which is a subset of the 12 areas of business regulations covered by the Doing Business um, report um, done by the World Bank, um, we can also see Nigeria ranks relatively low. Um, if we look at 179th in its ranking out of the 190 economies, that was covered by the Doing Business Report. And then the individual areas that the trade in the border, across borders looks at are indicators 
um, to record the time and the costs um, associated with a set or three sets of procedures, um, which include border compliance, um, also um, compliance and domestic transport. So um, we can also see there is um, significant room for improvement for Nigeria to be more competitive in this area. Now, what is trade facilitation? Trade facilitation actually is a whole range um, between all interactions beginning from buying um, to the payment of um, particular service goods. Um, but when we look at the WTO definition of trade facilitation, it focuses on a narrow field. The broader definition includes commercial procedures, transport, regulatory, and financial. But the WTO, the World Trade Organization, focuses on the regulatory procedures and defines trade facilitation as the simplification and harmonization of activities, practices, and formalities involved in collecting, presenting, communicating, and processing data required for the movement of goods in international trade. The trade facilitation agreement itself was entered into force in February 2017 when two thirds of the membership of the WTO members um, 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 had ratified. To date, 153 countries have ratified, which includes 13 ECOWAS member states, and have also notified the WTO of the acceptance of this, what is called a protocol of amendment to be included in the larger body of WTO texts. One of the key provisions of the agreement was the need to establish trade facilitation committees as trade facilitation is a broad issue and it requires cooperation across a number of key stakeholders. For those who may not be aware of the trade facilitation agreement, just very quickly, it essentially aims to increase transparency for importers and exporters, improve governance through disciplines on role and decision making, modernize border implementation by streamlining processes and techniques, enhancing the movement of goods in transit and improving customs cooperation. It's broken into three key areas. The first section um, uh, contains 12 articles um, that um, are for expediting the movement, release and clearance of goods. The first five of these articles focus more on transparency, the importance to make information available. Um, the first, the next four from six to 10, the next five should I say, focus on streamlining border procedures and imposing disciplines. And then Article 11 focuses on streamlining traffic in transit and 12 focuses on strengthening cooperation. We then also have a section two, which outlines special implementation flexibilities for developing and least developed countries. And then finally, we have a section three that focuses on institutional arrangements, including the need to establish trade facilitation committees. If we go towards the AFCFTA and try and um, do a comparison on the TFA or the trade facilitation um, provisions in the AFCFTA, vis-a-vis um, -vis that of the WTO trade facilitation agreement, we find many similarities. But as a way of introduction, um, for those who may not be fully aware of the AFCFTA, I will just like to present a very brief overview that the AFCFTA is a framework agreement um, that covers um, a wide range of goods services and other issues to create a continental free trade area. Um, the negotiations are being handled in three phases. The first phase focuses on trading goods, trading services, and then the dispute settlement mechanism before going on to a phase two, which will look at competition policy, intellectual property rights, as well as investments, and conclude with a phase three on electronic commerce. If we look at the framework of the agreement itself, we can see that um, there's a protocol in goods that has nine annexes, as well as three appendices. And one of those annexes is on trade facilitation, which I'll explain in a little bit more detail shortly. Then we have a protocol on trading services. And then we have a protocol on the rules and procedures for the settlement of disputes. And we'll be working on, as I've mentioned earlier on, during phase two and three negotiations on protocols on investment, competition policy, and intellectual property rights, as well as electronic commerce. Um, you may want to know that at this stage, um, 54 out of 55 African countries have signed the AFCFTA, um, and that includes all ECOWAS member states. However, to date, only 30 um, African states have ratified 
um, through their parliaments um, the agreement. So um, we still have a way to go. And in the region, um, we also have some member states that are yet to ratify. And it's very important that um, ratification is done in order to be a state party and implement um, the provisions of this agreement. As I've mentioned, if we look at the protocol on trading goods, it covers a wide range of issues. First of all, the schedule of tariff concessions, which essentially are the tariffs um, which will be liberalized, which are sensitive and which are in the exclusion list. So the agreement was that um, over a period of 10 years, um, we would liberalize 90% um, of our tariff lines, which will be followed by a liberalization um, over a 13 year period of sensitive um, lists, and then there'll be 3% of our tariff lines which will be in the exclusion that will not be liberalized at all. As with every free trade agreement, there is a need to have rules of origin to determine the originating status of these products to ensure they can benefit from the preferential um, um, tariffs. There's corporate customs cooperation, trade facilitation, non-tariff barriers, technical barriers to trade, sanitary and phytosanitary standards, transit and transport, as well as trade remedies, which are all part of the annexes. But if you permit me to concentrate on the topic, which is trade facilitation. And in Annex 4 of the AFCFTA, trade facilitation has the objective of simplifying and harmonizing international trade and procedures and logistics to expedite the processes of importation, exportation, and transit. Bearing in mind, we also have a number of landlocked countries in West Africa as well as expediting the movement, clearance, and release of goods. What we find essentially is that um, inspiration was drawn strongly in the um, development of articles for the Annex 4 based on the WTO trade facilitation agreement. So we find many similarities, um, as I've mentioned in the earlier articles of the TFA, that links um, our objectives within the continent with similar objectives um, globally, which also includes on transparency, on transit, um, and other key issues. This slide shows a broader perspective of enablers that are required to ensure that the AFCFTA um, becomes or realizes its full um, opportunity. Um, it's not simply a matter of liberalizing tariff lines or schedule of commitments for trading services, but there are a number of um, key issues that have to be addressed, including investments, taking investment measures, including production, improving our productive capacity, as well as, if you can see in the third and the middle column, trade facilitation measures to ensure that goods can move efficiently across borders. Trade facilitation is not only important for exports, but also for imports. We require cheap imports in order to um, enter into our production processes and um, to also be able to produce um, cheaper final goods for sale to the market. So it is very important to take trade facilitation um, as a priority. And also um, a focus on transport logistics. And we also have an area on import defense measures, which includes protection for infant industries, as well as trade remedies. Moving on. What are now the existing instruments or initiatives that we have at the regional level? Um, trade facilitation is not new to the region. In fact, it's one of the foundational principles of our regional integration agenda. Um, that is the movement or the free movement of goods, services, and capital. So one of the key instruments we have is the ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. And that essentially, is our way of operationalizing our free trade area within the ECOWAS community, where goods can move without being charged duties, as long as they fulfill the requirements of rules of origin, that is for um, industrial products. We also have the ECOWAS Common External Tariff um, that entered into force in 2015, January, um, whereby we have a common set of tariffs applied to third party countries outside of West Africa. We have a common, the ECOWAS Customs Code that seeks to improve um, the processes and procedures in harmonized fashion um, for our customs administrations. And we also have customs interconnectivity to try and enable their systems to be able to talk to each other. Part of our efforts towards digitalization and um, paperless and more efficient ways of working. 
We have initiatives related to the transit of goods, um, the development of physical infrastructures, including joint border posts, as well as priority corridors. We undertake a number of capacity building workshops for national trade facilitation committees, for border officials, including customs, immigration, and also for the private sector, with a particular focus, not only on the organized private sector, but small scale cross-border traders. We've also developed a non-tariff barrier alert mechanism where operators can identify or highlight challenges they're facing and report it directly to us. So this initiative has started off in a pilot set of countries within the region, and very shortly, it will also be um, available across the entire region of West Africa, um, where operators can alert when they come across any obstacles, and we will take um, that on board and try and resolve it. Important is also the movement of persons. Um, goods um, usually are moved with persons, either transportation-wise or even in trade and services, the movement of persons are important. And we have ECOWAS biometric passports within ECOWAS, which we are working towards the implementation of. I've mentioned the establishment of trade facilitation committees. In particular, we're working to strengthen the national trade facilitation committees, as well as establish a regional trade facilitation committee. And in order to also meet the transparency provisions, we are also um, going to shortly launch an ECOWAS trade information system that will provide um, key information on rules and regulations pertaining to trade. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope that by this brief overview, we can see the linkages between the WTO trade facilitation agreement, which seeks to improve the movement of goods and the provisions within trade facilitation um, within the African continent of free trade area, which draws heavily from um, TFA and the trade facilitation agreement at the multilateral level. And we've also been able to see a number of regional initiatives that operationalizes, puts into practice um, the, and supports the movement of goods across borders. So on that note, I thank you for your attention and I remain available for any questions that you may want to ask. Thank you, over to you, moderator. Uh, moderator, I think your microphone is on mute. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Shofala, uh, for such uh, an exceptionally succinct um, compression of multiple concepts, concepts that would probably require webinars of their own. Uh, you've broken down very well uh, the WTO TFA, which is an agreement that Nigeria has signed on to and ratified, um, agreeing to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of regulatory requirements. You broke down the AFCTA, another agreement, a separate agreement that Nigeria has signed on to, but not yet ratified, uh, which aims to remove tariff barriers and uh, increase the volume of trade among African countries. Uh, there have been many concepts that may be new to um, some of our participants. You've, you talked about tariff lines, liberalization, transit, uh, and listed about 11 ECOWAS initiatives, which I'm very sure uh, would raise questions. Uh, what, I'm, what this webinar is supposed to do is to pique interest, increase um, knowledge, and then perhaps direct participants to where they can find uh, further information with regards to this concept. Thank you so much, Mr. Shofola. Um, at this point of the webinar, we we're going to have another speaker, um, Mr. Aliu Abubakar, the Director of Trade um, from the Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. But he's going to be represented by Mr. Ali uh, uh, Nda Abu, who is an Assistant Director in the same ministry. Uh, Mr. Ali Nda Abu has over 12 years of experience in international trade negotiations, specifically the uh, WTO, uh, and then regional and bilateral trade agreements. He's also uh, well experienced in trade related issues and has proven track record in providing policy analysis and briefing for top level management within the ministry. He has obtained very, various levels of capacity in terms of knowledge on multilateral, multilateral trade system obligations and matters such as the non-agricultural market access, trade facilitation, and the development dimension. 
Mr. Ali Ndabu is going to be speaking on uh, the level of the uh, CFA implementation in Nigeria. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ali Ndabu, Assistant Director, Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. Okay, thank you very much, um, my moderator. I am, I'm so delighted to be part of this uh, presentation as well. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm sitting in for my director uh, since he's out on, on another assignment and he has asked that I sit in for him to discuss some of the issues that he's been discussed there. And particularly, he gave his uh, thanks to the, the organizers, of course, of this event and to my good friend, Mr. Kola of ECOWAS, acting director of trade. Now, my, my, my topic of discussion is to talk about the current status of the TFA implementation in Nigeria. Of course, the sources, challenges, and perhaps the way forward. But by way of background, we all know what trade facilitation is all about. Um, it is about uh, simplification, uh, harmonization, modernization, and standardization of um, custom procedures and processes. Of course, reduction in time and cost is very relevant. Now, in line with the WTO agreement, especially Article 23 on institutional arrangement, uh, Nigeria established the Tax Force on Trade Constitution in 2010 with membership drawn from um, various MDAs and organized private sector. Now, after the adoption of WTO agreements uh, in, during the Ninth Ministerial Conference in Bali, uh, the Federal Executive Council in 2014 reconstituted the committee. You know, before now, the Nigeria had a Tax Force, tax force on Trade Constitution. Uh, which was government side, I think it was in the presidency. Uh, now, in line with that uh, app uh, approval, the committee was reconstituted with chairmanship, government side in the Ministry of Trade and Investment. And um, the co chair is the Nigerian Customs Service. And of course, members, again, like I said, includes the private sector and other trade related agencies in, in the country. Now, specifically, the objective for Nigeria. Uh, Trade Facilitation Committee was to su support the enforcement of national policies and the implementation of WTO agreements, WTO agreement on trade facilitation, and perhaps ensure that uh, we address. Thank you, uh, thank you, moderator, for putting up the membership. Uh, this is very, very lovely. So, yeah, that, that, those are the membership there. Uh, yeah, uh, private sectors, of course, 17 membership, and then there's private sector and other members. I don't want to list out everyone, but I think everyone listed there are very relevant to the achieving of uh, our objective. Now, key, key to note also is that the Trade Station Committee is expected to provide operational solutions to trade, on Trade Station at both at um, seaports, border ports, and international airports in line with our national development objectives. Of course, in line with international best practices. Now, I don't, I, I don't wish to go into the terms of reference what the committee is expected to do, but quickly, uh, uh, like you might, some of my have known, uh, Nigeria uh, submitted this uh, instrument of ratification of the trade agreement upon signing and, um, and became one 107 member that, that, that um, submitted this instrument of ratification uh, out of. Uh, 164 members then. In line with the agreement also, Nigeria was expected to submit its categories, category, uh, categorization of agreements, like you know what the categories are, category A and B, C. A uh, says that those are provisions that, of course, that will be implemented immediately after the agreement comes into force. Category B are those agreement, or those commitments that will require transition period between the first to fifth year, the five years. Um, category C, uh, comment, commitment that we require both transitional period and, of course, technical assistance. So Nigeria devastated this instrument on the 17th of February 2017 at the WTO. Now, in after a series of meetings or uh, workshops and uh, uh, stakeholders and consultation, um, the, the, the NTFC, that is the Trade Facilitation Committee, um, submitted 14 measures under category A, uh, which is about 20%, 28% of the entire provisions. 
um, this provision includes penalties, pre shift uh, pre pre arrival processes, separation of uh, release from final destination to custom uh, duties, taxes, um, voluntary restraint, and non discrimination, among others. But of course, there are 14 commitments that we submitted under that category. In category B, uh, we submitted 26 measures, amounting to about 52%, which was validated again by the same um, workshop that we did, uh, including issue, talking about issue of inquiry points, provision of rule, um, advanced ruling, rights of appeal, among others. The under category C, we submitted um, 10 number of commitments, ranging from publication and test, test procedures, risk, manage, risk management, single window, um, national transit corridors, and custom corporations. Now, in 2019, Nigeria submitted her definitive dates for category B and C commitment. What that means is that they are they are specific dates that once this thing becomes, uh, it comes into enforcement, we'll be able to achieve certain um, result. Uh, at some of our definitive dates were 2022, while some are 2020, which means we're already in Implementation, implementation stages. Now, in line with this, uh, I'll tell you whether we've, we're making success there or we're making uh, progress, but uh, which is, of course, we, that, that's the essence of this uh, uh, workshop or webinar, webinar. But one key success story that I, I, I will relate to is that during this period, uh, the National Action Plan was being developed to facilitate the implementation of the three facility programs in Nigeria. Now we created two working groups to consider regulatory framework, time and cost of doing business in Nigeria. The report uh, when released, uh, of course with the assistance of our donor agencies, was used to generate an action plan, uh, which after various deliberation by members of NTFC was also validated. Now between the year 2016 and 2018, uh, the committee, with the support of course, with our donor agencies, uh, the World Bank, I think, uh, did a situation analysis, gap analysis, implementation of the TFA in Nigeria, and developed our national trade facilitation roadmap for the implementation of the, uh, the TFA in Nigeria. Now, with the support of uh, UNTAC, this roadmap was developed, and it is, of course, a living document that provides the framework for a national trade facility reform programs covering a period of uh, five, five years, between 2018 and 2022, including a, sing a, a single version, uh, vision supported by specific goals and activities that we need, to achieve, we need to drive through to achieving the set goals that we set for ourselves. Well, as, as, you, as you speak now, we're in 2020, and we've, we thought uh, speaking through the current realities, there's the need for, for us to review the process. I mean, review the, 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 the roadmap, which is undergoing current, presently undergoing um, some review. And I'm sure when the time comes for us to share with all our members, the stakeholders, we'll sit down together to revalidate what we've done, to see how we're doing and um, how we're progressing. Now, by way of also wanting to say um, uh, that I wanted to take the agenda of three first agenda further, the Ministry, uh, of course, the NTFC, uh, got approval from the, 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 the minister that there was a need for us to establish trade facility centers or decks in all the six states of Nigeria, including uh, FCT, uh, for the purpose of monitoring that uh, trade flow and moving of goods and persons in these states. Also, in order to uh, and, uh, um, endanger the issue of strong collaboration between the public and private sector towards effective implementation of the trade we are of we are making more um, um, suggestions to uh, uh, consider the elevation of a private sector representative to the position of the vice chair of the ministry. And uh, I, I'm sure you agree with me that there's a reason for this because we believe that the private sector does in fact the agreement is for the private sector so the private sector does have a role to play and hence the need for us to quickly uh, uh, quickly uh, bring in on board uh, the, the the private sector into this into the scheme of play now 
the Federal Ministry of Industry is, is in the process of finalizing its uh, trade portal. And like you know, trade portal is really, really very important because it serves as a real um, online real time repository of information to guide importers and exporters on the requirements for their transaction that will lead those, uh, link them to trade related agencies' uh, websites. So interestingly, also to note is that uh, the minister, uh, very soon, uh, sooner or later, is um, also thinking of giving the trade station a new cap. While doing the role of trade station, they are also expected to play the role of uh, the NMC in the context of um, the CFTA agreement. Article, um, I think Article 8 of the non-tariff barrier measures talked about institutional arrangement. And one of the things they said then was that instead of to avoid duplication of institutions, there are certain institutions that you need to re, uh, re um, uh, what's the English word now, reorganize re to also play the same role that um, the NMC will play. In other words, we want to make sure that they will bring efficiency to anything that is killing trade uh, in Nigeria society. Now quickly, the, what is our present level of uh, implementation? But before I go to the uh, present level, uh, our current level, let me just quickly say to you that during the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, well, one of the key and one very important role that the uh, Trade Facility Committee played was that they, they were member, uh, they had a, a situation room, that's what we call it, the situation room for uh, emergency operation center to ensure they monitor um, um, essential movement of goods and, service, goods and services during the pandemic. So that was that you could see there was a free flow of goods and services across the country. And that was, that was a, one of the good things that the committee did. Now the current level of implementation. Well, of course, the, the WTO says uh, as at yesterday that our level of implementation is just about 18.9%. Unfortunately, it's a shame figure to, to pronounce uh, extremely very low, considering that, uh, that what this, the position that we're, is, is placed in the region, what Nigeria can do, and the effort of government, what government is doing currently to ensure that there's easy, um, uh, ease of doing business. But I'm sure this is, uh, goes, uh, goes into the issue of challenges. Why are we below the level, I mean, 18.9%? Even if you're in school, you're in school, 18.9%, that is, it's not even, it's not even fail, it's carry over. You have carry over that cost. But I'm sure we will not carry over this process because I know we have challenges that is impending into the, uh, the, the source, I mean, how we should proceed in terms of this. And of course, basically, uh, we know that the issue of lack of uh, adequate trade support infrastructure and facilities to speed up actions on trade is a key major challenge. And to be honest with you, I, mean, I, I like it or not, I think the priorities must be given to station activities in Nigeria, even though government is doing a lot in that category. But the issue of poor awareness, people are not really aware of what is this trade facilitation like government itself. And if you go to the MDS as well, you begin to notice that there's a lot of uh, capacity gas that is really, really uh, affecting their, their understanding of trade facilitation. You like it or not, uh, some agencies, uh, I'm sure, even having access to adequate uh, internet facilities and website uh, to fully put in place the implementation of this agreement is also a, a big challenge, including my ministry that I speak for. And uh, every the agreement so will, uh, member states should establish single window. Now, as of, Nigeria, as of today, I don't think Nigeria has a national single window. Of course, customs does have a single window, they call it, uh, but is it a national single window where all agencies related to trade are also, uh, as, they have access to that thing to work with. Now, uh, I think there's also the issue of irregular monitoring and review of activities of trade related agencies. I remember when, uh, when we wanted to check the level of implementation of these agencies, letters were written to them to tell us now that some of the argument or the, uh, yeah, some of the articles are already 2020 due, what is their level of implementation? And I'm, I'm sure most of them are yet to understand what we require or what we need to know. And again, that's something that we're really working towards to, to see we achieve that. And I think one of the things that we also need to really address or one of the main challenges 
is that the support provided by most uh, pay, uh, most uh, developed partners, uh, I think, should should be more focused on. It should be more demand driven. Uh, I mean, it should be demand driven and natural needs and priorities. So it's because if I if I'm sick, I tell you where I'm sick. You should be able to help me that this is where my sickness is. Not you telling me uh, you're not you are sick, but I need to treat uh, one ailment, not this one. I mean. Those are the kind of issues that we need to really address. And those are the kind of challenges that, that are really affecting the implementation of the argument. Again, lack of scan, scanners, I mean, at the ports, I mean, these are serious issues. Uh, if you go to the, some of our international airports, even the conveyor bed, in fact, some of them don't, they don't even work. And even when they work, it's only one. But if you go to other countries, you find out that they are, the conveyor bed are over triple. Flight, flight number AZ or whatever, your conveyor bed number eight is your is your way you pick your bags. But if you if you come into Nigeria, for instance, surprisingly, sometimes I, I, when you go looking for a bag, you'll be running from one conveyor bed to another conveyor bed. It's, it's just disorganized. Now, by way of saying, how do we proceed? How do we move forward? Uh, like I said, one way moving forward is first of all this elevation of the private sector, one private sector representative. To the position of the vice chair, because I think with them in uh, uh, driving with us as we go along will play a very important role. Now we need to also set up a monitoring group. I mean, monitoring group with specific objective that will aim to address most of the identified goals that we have at, uh, uh, identified for ourselves. Now I think what I was discussing this with my director, and I was saying to him that you see, for us to have that political buy-in or political way that we need. We need to change the leadership structure um, from maybe from the, the chair of the committee becomes either the permanent secretary or the minister of trade and investment, where you have the DG, uh, the DG of the, uh, the uh, DG of the uh, NAVDAC participating in an event, the DG of SON or the uh, controller general of the Nigeria custom in the meeting. And when they speak, you know, they're speaking trade facilitation. And I think those are the things that we need to really uh, working to, and, for, and I'll give, give you a very good, good example now. There are certain issues or policies that are being issued that sometimes you begin to wonder why is it coming from? Is because is it the members are not well informed, or the the, the representative of the members in the TNTFC are not giving proper feedback to their bosses? So this account kind of we need to have a political weight, and um, we we'll begin to assign greater responsibilities to the private sector. Now I think another way forward is to ensure we we must uh, establish. Or we, make, we must make use of a feedback mechanism, uh, effective use of feedback mechanism to address bottlenecks in the system. And also, we need to build more capacity, uh, more capacity, generate a more um, awareness campaign along the border communities and public, general, the general public. And um, we need to also have a, an effective and efficient coordination of donor agent support on TF issues. And um, and of course, uh, the baby of the room, uh, which is the main key thing, is funding. I, I think government must also begin to now give special provisions, uh, funding provisions for NTS activities. I know I speak very fast, uh, Mr. Moderator, but I guess I'm able to, if you heard me very well clearly, I think those are the positions I think uh, I've presented for you this morning. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, sir, for that. Uh, once again, we know these are concepts that uh, may take you an entire day uh, to do justice to, um, but we've, we've constrained you to expressing them within uh, 15 minutes. Just to quickly recap um, what we've gathered from your presentation before we go into the Q&A section, you've uh, essentially expressed to us um, you've uh, essentially expressed to us the fact that uh, Nigeria has um, signed and ratified in 2017 the WTO TFA and the fact that the WTO TFA has a list of commitments uh, categorized into three different areas. Um, those who are to be implemented immediately, those that uh, require a transition period, and those that require both a transition period and uh, some technical assistance. You've been able to uh, share with us some of the activities 
of the National Task Force on Trade Facilitation, which has now become the National Trade Facilitation Committee, uh, in terms of developing a national action plan, uh, having a plan to establish trade facilitation centers in the 36 states, uh, building a trade portal, uh, which is one of the requirements of the trade facilitation agreement, uh, making sure that the committee also plays the role as NMC, which is required by the AFCTA agreement, uh, effectively ensuring that AFCTA is linked to the trade facilitation agreement. Uh, you ex also expressed some challenges, uh, the, the poor level of awareness, capacity gaps at agencies, um, and proposed some solutions. Uh, perhaps it's time to look into the structure of the trade facilitation committee by in order to focus on having more political will, uh, giving greater responsibility to the private sector, uh, ensuring there's a feedback mechanism, and then capacity development and looking into the areas of funding. Once again, I thank you very much for doing uh, so well at compressing um, such a very large subject into 15 to 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes uh, presentation. So as to give us a bit more time to deliberate and have uh, questions and answers. Um, so, uh, dear participants, you've heard from Mr. Kolawale uh, Shofola, you've heard from Mr. Nda Ali Abu, uh, and we're about to go into the um, section of the webinar that has to do with questions and answers. I would um, request that you make use of the Q&A button on your Zoom platform. There have been some questions that have come in already, but I also appeal that um, you restrict your questions to the topic of the webinar because um, Nasima webinars are supposed to be business-like. Most our webinars are not supposed to exceed an hour, although this one might exceed that by just a few minutes. So please restrict your questions to the uh, concepts of trade facilitation, uh, the AFCTA, uh, and the, the challenges that have been noted by both Mr. Shofola and Mr. Nda Abu Ali. With that, uh, the floor is open for questions, comments, uh, and contributions. Um, if, while we wait for that, if, if I may pose a question to Mr. Shofola, uh, if, if you're still with us, um, you, you, you presented some, some stats with regards to ease of doing business and trading across borders. Uh, our question is, is ECOWAS currently monitoring these indicators uh, in terms of non-tariff barriers at a separate level from World Bank? Uh, and if yes, how is this currently happening? Is, there, is ECOWAS currently measuring the level of trade facilitation uh, among the 15 member states um, and uh, how, how is this currently working? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And <clears throat> let me this opportunity to thank you for your wonderful moderation, Mr. Poyem Melara. Um, remarkable indeed. And also I see the DG was also on the line. Um, this initiative is extremely laudable and we look forward to participating in, in similar rounds. So, so the question, we all know that the World Bank doing business um, is um, carried out with the methodology of um, a survey where it's more about a perception. Um, and even in the recent past, um, there have been some challenges if you've been following the news as to um, potential manipulation of survey results. So what is ECOWAS doing? ECOWAS does not as of yet have a holistic um, doing business monitoring system like the World Bank. Um, we don't have a composite monitoring system, but we do monitor at respective technical levels. So for example, if we go to issues of ports, we support our member states in undertaking time release studies, which essentially measures the effectiveness of your ports to bring in goods, how quickly it takes to offload, um, reload and move out. Um, we, we also look at um, trying to um, do a survey on the number of procedures um, that are within each member state for specific um, exports 
um, related goods. So we have technical level surveys, but as of yet, we do not have one holistic, comprehensive um, indicator or range of indicators like that of doing business. But we are slowly moving towards that. So please let me um, inform you, um, like I mentioned in my presentation, there'll be a number of platforms you'll be able to go to and get additional information beyond the ECOWAS website, which is ECOWAS.INT. There will also be an ECOWAS trade information system. And once that is available, we'll make sure we pass that on to um, the organizers to ensure they can spread it within um, the membership of NASIMA as well as other stakeholders that are watching. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Shokola. A quick follow-up question um, that, that's actually been posted by one of the participants. Um, can your presentation be shared? And I will want to add um, in, in sharing uh, materials from this webinar to all those who participated, besides your presentation, can we look to you to uh, providing any other relevant materials that you think we should share to participants that would uh, improve their knowledge of this concept? Simple response, yes. Um, the presentation will be shared. And um, as of when you contact us, um, our doors are open and transparency is key for us. So any regional document in particular that you require on the ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme, the customs code, or any of our other initiatives, we'll be pleased to share them with you. Um, so you can contact us either directly or go through um, NASIMA, and then we can also make that available through them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Shifola. Um, while we wait for other questions to be posted, um, the next question is for Mr. Ali uh, Ndabu. Um, I, I, I think you're I hope you're still with us. Um, you did mention that uh, based on the AFCTA, I mean, based on the TFA agreement that Nigeria signed and ratified, that there were some commitments, and you mentioned some dates uh, that um by which nigeria was to implement uh, some of those things the question is um has covid 19 the covid 19 pandemic affected this commitments uh and if yes um what what's the mechanism for ensuring um that the trade Association committee can still meet up with those commitments within the time specified or is the wto going to be extending um, those commitment vis-a-vis -vis the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Mr. Ndabo, uh, are you with us, sir? Uh, well, actually, um, Mr. Ndali has to um, quickly attend to one other meeting that he's chairing as well. So I just um, sat by his side and he asked me to speak if there's any question that will be raised. So particularly to your question, um, yesterday, there was uh, my name is Dayo Okewole. I'm also from the Department of Trade in the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. So, yesterday we also had um, a meeting, and this question was put across to one of the um, WTO representatives in terms of the effect of the pandemic on the global trade and the world, every country in, at large. So, we tried to look at what can be done to probably give an extension generally to countries, especially as regards the implementation of the commitments in the WTO TFA. So, uh, well, it, it was proposed that there will be a series of meetings that will be coming up very soon um, in Geneva, maybe through online or physical, that this has already been put as one of the agendas that we discussed during the meeting. So we are waiting on what will come out of that because Definitely, almost all countries of the world is being affected by the pandemic, and it will, of course, have effect on our performance in regards to implementation of the provisions of the agreement as submitted. So we also have the same issue, and uh, we are putting it across to WTO. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Adai. Okay, well, you're welcome to the webinar, and we, we thank you for um, standing in for Abu Ali. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, so a, a follow-up question on, on that. Mr. Ali did mention that our current implementation level is 18.9%. Um, and the follow-up question is this, because he also mentioned that uh, some of the solutions are greater responsibility for the private sector. Um, does your department have any views with regards to uh, which areas you would really want the private sector to come in um, to ensure faster implementation, to raise us um, quite, to raise us higher than the 18.9% implementation level. Um, essentially, the question is this, if you had a magic wand and there was something you wanted the private sector to start working on from today, what would those uh, issues be? Hello, Mr. Okewale. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, the private sector, just like um, Mr. Ali said before he stood up, you know, this agreement, the, everything basically is uh, for the private sector because they are the ones on the field and um, we, we know that the, everything should be focused on them. The government will just uh, play the role of creating the enabling environment for all these things to work very well so that the economy can be developed. So uh, actually the, the private sector will come in in so, so many ways actually, but one of them is that we really need to hear from them because they are the ones that wear the shoe and they know where it pinches. So the, the whatever grievances, whatever issues they have, they, they need to bring them up as quick as possible. Um, there are some areas, there are some times that um, the ministry has had to come up with um, resolving disputes or bottlenecks that they have had. Um, that's why we try as much as possible to talk with um, Asima, who's like an umbrella body for the private sector. So we, the, the, the trade facilitation centers that is, we, are, we are trying to come up with is also one of those issues so that in all the states, you know, going to the grassroots now, so that issues that come up you know, from them, we can hear it and then use the, the leverage of uh, communication that we have with um, the relevant agencies, especially customs and SON and NAVDAC and all the rest so that we can you know, leverage on it to solve those issues on time because we know that time is of essence when it comes to trade and in doing business. So these issues have to be resolved quickly. So basically we need the private sector to speak more to us so that we can be able to um, resolve any issues that you have to to reduce the costs and the time in the unit business. Thank you very much, Mr. Akiwale. So essentially, um, to be involved in feedback mechanism uh, and providing exactly. feedback to the community. So now some questions from the chat room. Um, this question is directed to Mr. Shofola. Um, and the question goes to us, um, to common Nigerian citizens, they would like to know the benefits that can be derived from this. Um, so I would want to rephrase this question to say, in the most layman terms, could you express um, to someone who, is, who has no knowledge of this, these terminologies, could you express how trade facilitation is of benefit uh, to the average Nigerian? Uh, that's the first question. And let me just ask the second one, which is coming from the DJ of Nasima. Uh, the second question is from the perspective of the ECOWAS Commission, what's your opinion on, or what's your assessment on the success of the ETLS, the success of uh, the realization of the ETLS? So the first question, in layman's terms, what's the benefit of all these things we're saying to the average Nigerian? And second question uh, from DG, what's your perspective uh, or the course assessment on the success of uh, the ETLS? Thank you, sir. Um, thank you to distinguished participants for that que those questions. Um, so it's a good thing I'm a layman myself, so I'll just speak as myself. Um, it's the ability, trade facilitation is the ability to move goods cheaper and quicker. And what does that mean? 
for the consumer, if goods are moved cheaper and quicker, it means that they have a wider range of goods available to them at a lower rate. These goods could be goods that um, are also complementary to other services. But if I go to producers, which is also very important, um, these goods are those that can be part of your inputs into production. So having these goods um, available, which may not be so readily available within Nigeria, coming from either within the region or from outside at a cheaper, faster rate will contribute towards your production, hopefully increase um, your production capacity, um, increase employment, increase your sales. And also by the time you also want to export these goods, you can reach a wider market um, beyond the Nigerian market alone. So that is uh, moving goods quicker and cheaper, um, benefits for both consumers as well as producers. And on the ETLS, um, that's a very heavy question, sir. Um, what would I rate our success on the ETLS? ETLS is a, a flagship initiative of ECOWAS. And when I say ECOWAS, I am not talking about the commission where I work. ECOWAS is made up of our 15 member states and headed by the authorities of heads of states. And one of the agreements we reached together was to allow goods that are made in the region to be able to move freely within the region without charging them additional duties. This is not only political, but an economic statement. And um, to that effect, um, it is true that considering the number of businesses that we have in Nigeria alone, um, we may not have the level of um, registration, should I say, of companies onto the ETLS. Um, we need, through your organization, sir, to encourage more businesses to register onto ETLS. And we also need to look at improving our processes. One of the initiatives we are looking into um, through digitalization is the e-certificate of origin. Um, also being able to perhaps, um, when we have the national approval committees who are the national institutions that look at each of the applications to be registered onto the ETLS, and when they meet, um, we can also look at improving their productivity by perhaps meeting virtually, so you don't have to wait till everybody's together, and also taking decisions, like I said, in a more remote manner. So in a nutshell, ETLS is a flagship initiative. We need to encourage more utilization of it, um, because within West Africa alone, we have a very large market, even beyond Nigeria. There are many countries requiring products of Nigeria, and there are many inputs Nigeria could also benefit from from outside. Um, but we also need to leverage on technology to improve our procedures um, and our processes. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Mr. Asifala. Before you go, uh, one question that just came in that uh, I think should be directed at you. Um, so, based on the WTO CFA um, from Mr. Fidelis on how is compliance to the agreement going to be enforced among the countries who have ratified? and how would disputes be resolved? Uh, I know the answers to this will probably be vested in perhaps a different webinar on the, on the clauses of the agreement, but I'll crave your indulgence to just use um, a minute or two to give uh, insight into how compliance will be enforced and how disputes are resolved. And thank you for that question. And it shows the level of aptitude of your participants. These are very, very important and fundamental questions. But I'll start by taking a step back. Um, the trade facilitation agreement is within the body of now the overall WTO um, set of agreements. And these are international obligations. Um, and within the WTO framework, there are mechanisms for enforcement, um, for compliance as well, and if necessary for sanctions. So if we go on to compliance, um, part of the instruments under the WTO and part of the obligations, our countries are meant to notify um, changes and their status of implementation of their various responsibilities. And there are various bodies at the WTO, which has a secretariat, a dedicated secretariat in Geneva that monitor this on a regular basis. Uh, beyond um, notifications, there are also periodic trade policy reviews, which means that 
Um, there will be missions sent to every country, and the larger your country, the more often they come to visit to ensure that countries are meeting to the obligations, not just on trade facilitation, but on agriculture, on sanitary and phytosanitary products, the range of agreements that um, WTO members have signed up to. And they review this on a periodic basis to ensure that countries are meeting up with their obligations. And where they don't, there are, within the WTO framework, there is what we call the dispute settlement system. So there are levels of um, notifying um, the WTO secretariat, saying that a particular country is not meeting its um, obligations. And initially it's consultations, and then it can be more legal, going to appeal bodies, and then finally um, decisions are taken. Um, earlier this week, um, a few days ago actually, I think it was, um, the WTO, um, China raised an issue um, against US tariffs that were raised um, um, some time ago at the beginning of the trade war between China and the US. And the WTO recently found that um, China or the, the US um, did not have sufficient evidence to raise those tariffs. So it was not meeting its obligations. So the WTO can take and make these statements and then um, the, the US could appeal, it goes to an appeal body, um, and then there are mechanisms to ensure that um, sanctions could also be levied. Um, so that is what I would say at this stage. But like you said, um, this is indeed a, a topic on its own. And even within the AFTFTA, there is a dispute mechanism as well to ensure that if countries are not meeting up with their obligations, um, they go through a similar level of initial consultations prior to more legal proceedings that will end up in possible decisions and sanctions against um, the uh, member states or the state party that is not meeting up with, with its obligations. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Shufola. Um, I want to thank all our participants for being patient and our, our speakers as well. We're already 17 minutes beyond time. So I'll take just one last question. Um, then, um, our, a member of the NASIMA uh, Trade First and um, NASIMA Committee on AFCT would speak, then the DG, obviously. Uh, but, DG, if you would permit me to have you speak last so that uh, through your comments, we also uh, round up the, the webinar. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, so, uh, the last question that I'm reading out before Mrs. Aisha Rama, a member of the NASIMA AFCT Committee, speaks, uh, uh, is actually directed to uh, Mr. David Okewale, who is standing in for Mr. Alinda, who, who is representing the Director of Trade. Um, so the question from Mr. Stanley Okof, who says, uh, the constitution and makeup of the National Committee of Trade Facilitation has over 17 different organs of government and just five organs of the private sector. Um, is this itself not a barrier to easing the process? Uh, so. Mr. Uh, Okewale, what, what do you think about uh, that question? Although I, I, I do think I have an answer, but I would, I would want you to just uh, present an answer to that question. Okay, um, let me quickly respond to that. Well, um, initially when the Federal Executive Council was um, re-inaugurating the committee, uh, one of the um, leverage that was given was that we have the opportunity to co-opt other members as we feel as we didn't fit so um if you look at the constitution of the membership initially it was like um, 17 or 19 or thereabout yeah 17 so but as we speak we have about 35 members so a lot of other uh, relevant stakeholders have been included in the committee um we have anarcha we have um, um, I can't see uh, Naka here. We have some women groups that have joined, women, uh, National Women Business Forum. Um, a lot of other private sector organizations have been co-opted. This was just the initial um, constitution of the membership of the committee. So I think we, we envisaged that there will be need to bring in more members and that was graciously approved by the Federal Executive Council when they were giving the approval. So presently we have about 35 members constitution and we still have the, the opportunity to add more members as we 
as it, as it we deem necessary. Also, if you look at um, Nasima, one of the members, uh, private sector members, it, it's, um, it's a conglomeration of other private sector bodies. So we believe that information or um, any message that we have will be disseminated to them through this national body. So that is why, you know, um, going to invite every organization or every private sector participant will be somehow cumbersome. So NASIMA will do a lot of work by disseminating the information to all these private sector, other private sector members. Thank you. I believe I answered the question. 100%, sir. Um, you did 100%. So just one final, uh, Mrs. Aisha Umar, a member of our NASIMA uh, committee on AFCTA. She actually posted a comment uh, which talked about the abuses of the ETLS. So I would want to give her the opportunity to speak, but fo to focus more on uh, what could be done from the private sector point of view or government sector in looking at that. Then following Mrs. Aisha Omar, uh, the DJ would also speak uh, to round up the event. So uh, Mrs. Aisha Omar, you have the floor. You could unmute and you could speak. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, this is an excellent um, webinar. So I was uh, talking about, my question had to do with what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this issue of a violation of the rules of origin? Um, what has happened, as we all know, with the rice, and uh, I saw it um, in Medjugorje with uh, supermarkets. I was there just two days ago, and they're packed full of all the things that you can imagine, imported foods and everything. So what is happening is there's a violation of rule of origin. Now, I know there's a dispute settlement mechanism. So what we could do is perhaps Nigeria should be the first country to take it up um, at the ECOWAS level, um, rather than using the kinetic um, approach of closing borders using force. Maybe we should go and have a talk at the, at the level of dispute settlement since there's a mechanism. Um, maybe that, that's, a, that's a way of doing it. The second option is um, maybe think about using uh, a bit like, you know, the NAFDAC um, um, thing they put where you can check a code and see if it's authentic or not. So supposing we were to impose um, all goods should have this tag and then we can tell whether it's imported or it's not. And then we can have uh, our customs can just storm any supermarket or any shop or anything and start to seize imported stuff. And then perhaps they will stop what they're doing. Thank you. I hope it makes sense. Um, thank you very much, Ma. I mean, it absolutely does. And um, basically what we did was use the opportunity to emphasize the importance of a feedback mechanism and the hopes that at the different levels of the private sector, such conversations as these can come up and then get fed back to the National Committee on Trade Facilitation. Uh, hopefully in the age of the new normal, like uh, Mr. Chofala said, there will be less need to meet physically and there will be more virtual meetings and such feedback would increase uh, the level of implementation. Thank you so much for that, Madam. Uh, with this, uh, I, give, I give the floor over to the DJ, Ambassador Ayola Lukoni, who uh, I'm very sure has some comments, some questions, and who would also uh, round up the webinar. Thank you so much, sir. Well, um, thank you once again, um, um, Madam Okwe. And I want to thank all our panelists and all those who have joined us uh, in this webinar. And I must say that uh, I think, to a large extent, we've been able to uh, achieve the purpose for this seminar, this, um, this webinar, uh, because it is part of the process of sensitization. And um, it has to continue. It has to continue. Uh, the more we do more of it, the more ideas we go. I, I want to thank Mr. Um, um, Aisha Umar for what she said. These are some of the feedback uh, which we want. We don't claim to have all the answers. Um, it's always very good to hear, especially from people on the field who are on the ground, uh, because we're not contesting for just ideas in people's head. We are talking about ideas that have, that have practical implementation. And I think she's raised some of those issues. I mean, the question and the, the discussion which has come in here has um, thrown up the old question of, can we continue to, to close our borders? These are the questions which, of course, 
is 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 is, is, is facing us now. Talking about your question of trade facilitation, can we still continue to? That's one of the questions which I think uh, at, the, at the national level we need to quickly answer because it is also hurting some of our members as well who produce goods and send these goods across. And they've kept on to the old ETLS procedures in terms of the, also including the question of rules of origin. Secondly, I think my, my, my dear brother from the Ministry of Trade and, and Trade and Investment has also raised the question and issues of uh, at, at the grassroots level, beyond Abuja or beyond Lagos, how many people who are there in the states are aware of this trade facilitation process? And I think that is one of the areas which, of course, uh, we need to look at as well. I'm glad and very happy that as Nasima, um, we are a chambers of commerce, not chambers of commerce. Implicitly, the respective city chambers across the country can be very useful in terms of passing on the ideas, in terms of engagement about and informing people about the trade facilitation process. Because um, whether you like it or not, we do have SMEs and members, producers who are in those places and eager to, of course, um, key into trade facilitation process and also key into the EFCTA in the final analysis. The last time we were in Oweri for the Nasima Council meeting, and people and factories are members who are in and around the places. Some of them produce nodules, some of them produce uh, uh, lubricants, some of them well, we say, look, you seem to forget us. We are here in these places, far away, and we do have the capacity to export. We do have the capacity to take advantage of, but you, you seem to have forgotten us. So I think this is one of the things which, of course, we need to regularly remind ourselves as far as this is concerned. And the instrumentality or the platform of the chambers, city chambers of commerce, state chambers of commerce are very, very useful areas in which we can do sensitization and also bring in those people who are practically on ground who can deal with these issues. Um, so that we don't, we don't restrict all of this just to ourselves uh, in these places, either on this webinar. Let us, and of course, thank God to the new normal, we can also use virtual meetings to be able to take the message across to, 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 those, um, to those places. Um, well, I haven't said that. I, I think once again, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, it's, uh, it took, the series will continue. We will look at various area um, as we continue, as we go on. And I want to thank Mr. Shofola um, from ECOWAS Sectorial. I want to thank our God colleagues also from the Ministry of Trade Investment, uh, uh, Ministry of Investment, Trade and Investment, you know, themselves and all of our stakeholders uh, who have joined us uh, at, this, at, at, at this webinar. Um, once again, thank you. Please, uh, we trust that when next we extend the invitation to you, you will also join us on the next in, 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 looking at other areas. Like I said, we come back. The AFCTA is not dead, cannot be dead. There's a the focus on it. Events like this have to keep the mental on, and we must because it is going to be an existential reality for all of us. And it's a strategic option in terms of rebooting the economy uh, back on track. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I want to say thank you to the entire members of the Secretariat who have supported uh, the team, those who work behind the high lines and work in the field and work in the, the buttons too as well. Um, thank you once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, with that, thank you so much, uh, all our participants, for taking the time to come. Uh, this brings to an end today's webinar. Um, we would send all the materials we get from the speakers to everyone who has registered. Thank you so much. Do have a great day.